a detective job. You yeah. know, gee, you can be really fooled. Okay, so how not to be fooled or how to follow these things is keep an eye on the problem. It, when you see something, watch it. If it's weird looking stuff, just watch it. Take some pictures. Keep records, keep notes, write it on the calendar, make note, you know, whatever you want to do. I mean, just fill your phone with pictures. Because many problems occur at the same time every year, and you may see some varieties are going to have more of that issue, and the, the variety right beside it doesn't have it, and that's good to know. If you keep records, next year you're going to plant the variety that doesn't have the problem. So this is how we tell um, if the problem is getting better or worse. Because sometimes we see damage and it's too late, or the plants recover from the disease. Plants will recover. They have an immune system. And they can recover and grow well when conditions improve for the plant. OK, so you know, there's some ways of telling what, what if, if there's insects around. You can put sticky traps out to monitor. Um, the spotted wing drosophila, that's a fruit fly that has, it looks just like the fruit flies that get in your compost bucket or get on your rotten bananas and stuff. But it isn't. It's one that came from Asia, um, Japan, 10 years, eight years ago, nine, 10, maybe 10, oh, I keep thinking it was just eight years ago, but they've been around a while and they're still spreading. And they get into raspberries, blueberries, cherries. They've become a real nightmare for growers. And even organic growers have to spray a lot for these fruit flies. Well, you can tell if you've got them by putting out a trap with cider vinegar in it. So there's a, a number of different ways. So once you identify a pest problem, or once you <coughs> identify that the problem you have is an insect problem, you might find that there's ways to monitor, not just looking at them, but actually putting out a trap. If you were in a greenhouse and you wanted to know if you have white flies, that yellow sticky trap is your early warning system. Because they prefer, they'll go on that and get stuck first. And before you'll ever see them on the plants, you'll see them on the trap. And you'll never see those darn fruit flies, they're so little, until they get fall into the trap of vinegar. And then you can see them floating around. Uh, yeah. Pardon? I, I just, I had a, a spray bottle of vinegar and I took the top off to um, use it on another bottle. Mm -hmm. And I just left it there. And just a little while ago, I'm looking at this bottle of, I sniffed it because I'm like, why are they all, why are the, all the fruit flies in this bottle? And it was in here and I'm like, that's Yeah, it, it really attracts this particular fruit fly. Other fruit flies will too. Other insects will go in vinegar, which is, the, the traps are actually, this is really high tech, right? It's just a <laughs> deli container with the holes punched around the edge here and then put the lid on, put the vinegar and put the lid on so that only small insects can get in. But yeah, that's, it's, um, there are components of whatever we smell of vinegar in fruit, and they're attracted to that. That's in, right in there. So that's kind of an easy, cheap way to tell if you've got them. Can they be, sorry to interrupt you, can they be mistaken for like fungus snap and stuff like that? They yeah, they might. You, you, once you get used to it, uh, I'll show you a picture in a minute of what their wings look like. Um, they have spots on their wings, one spot. And it's called the spotted wing drosophila because of that. Whereas the compost bucket fruit flies don't have a spot. But otherwise, they look exactly the same. You would need a microscope. You really need to be checking it out. But yeah, fungus gnats wouldn't go in the vinegar. They'll go on those yellow sticky traps, though. Okay. So that's why I do like the vinegars, because pretty much all that falls in there is either an accidental insect that looks nothing like a fruit fly, or it is the fruit fly. There are pheromone traps um, that for some crop pests, now it takes some training to use these because these have a synthetic version of the scent that insects give out, um, a female moth would give out to attract males to mate. And so they put that in a, a lure, a little plastic or a rubber lure and it's inside the trap and it's sticky inside and the males fly in thinking there's a female there and they get stuck. So you see these, you see these being sold to gardeners. Okay, there's, there's, a, there's a thing here though. If you're gonna catch males, how's that gonna control your problem? Yeah. <laughs> you know, males are like eggs, eggs, right? Eggs yeah. don't turn into caterpillars. So they're for monitoring, because if you catch the males, it tells you the females are there. But they don't mention that for gardeners. Like, for some reason they keep selling these and gardeners <coughs> think, oh, they're just catching all these bugs, it must be working. Well, it's not really doing anything if you're just removing males. But a grower would use this trap to say, okay, I've caught two males, two weeks in a row, 
That's my signal that I need to spray for cod rape moth. If you don't catch any more than two males and you don't catch them two weeks in a row, they never treat. So that, that's the way you would use a pheromone trap, is just as an indication of what's going on. Yeah. I heard those traps can, like traps like that can bite you in the butt because it might attract insects that were there. Well, they'll just attract males. Yeah. But you're right. You know, um, I, you, I don't know if you've seen anything about the Japanese beetle invasion in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. uh, well, there's, some con there's a lot of concern because it's an eastern pest and it has never been out here. And now yeah. there's quite a few in Vancouver and they're trying to control them before they mm -hmm. get everywhere because they eat a lot of different things. Um, Japanese beetle traps, what they have in those traps do attract both sexes and that is a concern. If you put a trap out that also attracts females, of whatever the lure is inside, in a, in a neighborhood, you could you're getting everybody in the rest of the neighborhood into your garden, and that can back, definitely backfire. These only attract males. If you attracted every male in the entire county, it wouldn't hurt because they still can't lay eggs and affect your trees. But yeah, it, it, it depends what the trap is. It, it certainly can. Um, things make a lot of sense on an agriculture scale when you, you have a big field and you're doing something that don't make sense in a garden scale because it's too small of an area to use a technology like this. Okay, so just remember, just because you know what the problem is and you see injury doesn't mean you have to do anything or that even that there's anything you can do. This is a red currant leaf that's been chewed up really badly. But can you see from back there how dry the edges look on the leaf? Mm -hmm. Whatever did the damage did a long time ago. Right. It's over. It's gone. The guy has left. He's gone and made a cocoon someplace. <laughs> so, I, you know, sure, I didn't want that much damage, but it's too late. But you can write that down in your farm records, and next spring, look, a month earlier, start looking for what might have done this damage. So that's the way you would use a record like that, is there's nothing you can do now. And in this case, here's, this is apple aphids. This is what you, sh you should be looking yes, for. that's exactly what It's it exactly, yeah. These are the aphids. Most of them are dead. Yeah. And they've been eaten by these little orange things, these tiny little, actually it's a kind of maggot. They're incredibly small. They're smaller than aphids, or about the same size as aphids. They have, they're, they're in here, and they have killed all of these. But that, so that's what you're going to look for when um, the aphids have been in the trees for a while. But ants pull these little orange guys out and defend them. So if you can, the ants. so, the, so the, the key to making your aphid control work is to take the ants out of the equation. And then these guys, I mean, they're... Where do the maggots come from? They're, they're wild. They're native insects. And they'll just fly in. They're very good at finding aphids. And as well as you'll see lady beetles and lace wings and other, all kinds of other things eating the aphids too. But these, I just wanted to draw your attention to this picture because, again, it looks like, oh, oh I have to do something. Well, yeah. nope, they, they've done it. It's, yeah. it's all handled. So it depends what's being affected. Um, you know, if it's something that... Uh, I think I have a, no, I don't have a cotton moth picture in here. You know, a cotton moth caterpillar in an apple damages that apple. There's nothing you can do with that apple. But a tussock moth caterpillar on an apple tree is just eating a bit of leaf material. It's not touching the apple and it never will. So one caterpillar in one case is a problem and one caterpillar in another case is not a problem. So it depends, you know, what are your market requirements? How, is, how the produce is going to be used? Are the natural enemies present? Uh, this is a commercial carrot grower on Salt Spring, actually, this uh, using insect netting. So we have a lot of non-toxic things we can do before we ever move to, you know, figuring out a, a size or something. But you really have to know the pest. You have to know how the control method works and how that fits with the pest. And one example I give you is um, a winter moth. They're dropping out of the trees right now down in Victoria. There's a little caterpillar that comes down on a string. Yeah. Well, if the people that had those trees, they drop out of Gary Oaks and fruit trees and all kinds of things, any deciduous tree. If someone had put a sticky band around that trunk at Thanksgiving last year, and then it could take it down in February, the female moth, so the cocoons are in the soil, the female moth can't fly. She has to walk all the way up the tree to lay an egg out at the end of the branch. So you just put a sticky band on that tree trunk, intercept her, she's, she's killed, no eggs, no caterpillars, nothing happens. But because that was so successful around Victoria, people have been using it for decades, um, 
people have, I'll see things written in a gardening magazine that'll say, oh, put sticky bands up for caterpillars. Well, all the other caterpillars come from species of moths that fly. Like, there's no way they get caught. Why would they, why would they go around and walk up a trunk and get killed? So it works really well for one thing, but it doesn't work, has nothing to do with another kind of caterpillar. So that's what I mean. As long as you understand how things work, and it might be timing that's important. I mean, if you put sticky bands up for winter moth in September, it won't catch any. Or you don't put it up till spring, they're not there. You know, so they have to be used right to be effective. Now you can, pruning things out makes a lot of sense, even at a commercial scale. She's just getting tent caterpillar egg masses out in a tent caterpillar year. And pruning is the only way you're going to get some of these um, bark diseases or tree diseases out. You have to saw them, take out the branch that has black knot or it has, uh, that's European canker again. And cleaning up. Um, <coughs> there's sanitation. If you, if you know what the problem is, then you'll know whether a cleanup helps. Sometimes cleanups are working against the plant. Like, I'll give you an example of powdery mildew on the leaves. I showed you that white powdery stuff on the squash leaves. Mm -hmm. Well, some gardeners run out and pull off every leaf that has powdery mildew. Yeah, well, you can't control it that way. It's, it, it's, 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 just it's, it's it, no, it's just that there's spores everywhere and it's futile. It would be like, let's take sand off the beach. It's not gonna help. And by pulling all those leaves off, the plant is actually getting quite damaged because until the leaf turns brown, the plant can still photosynthesize. So by rushing out and sanitizing, you know, picking up every leaf, you're really damaging the plant and you're not controlling the disease. But in some cases, sanitation can work. If you can find the alternate host plant, if you get pear trellis rust, have you ever seen this on pear leaves, this weird orange thing? Well, this is a, Rusts are weird fungi. They often have an alternate host. It's on the pears in the summer, but in the winter, it's in juniper. So sanitation here is you find the infected juniper and you destroy <coughs> it. And then you have nothing that infects any pears in the neighborhood. So that works. That works. But taking all these little leaves off the pears doesn't work. But killing the, the juniper would. Uh, brown rot is a disease of um, plums and peaches. It overwinters on these shriveled up dried fruit mummies in the trees. So after the leaves have fallen off, the crop's over, everything's done. In the middle of the winter, you look up and you'll still see shriveled up fruit. Take a stick, knock them down, throw them in the garbage or bury them. And that is an excellent sanitation step because that fungus only overwinters in that mummified fruit. And if you didn't take it out in the spring when the rain starts, the spores will be on this fruit. There'll be a big fuzzy gray cloud of spores here, and the rain will just carry it down to every blossom in the tree. Can um, or you too? can just knock it out of the tree and throw it away, and you're done. You know, no fungicides are involved. Can that have, have an apple, apple trees, like a little shriveled up apple? On the um, not this disease on apple. Now that might be another cause, but this this would be on plums. Um, you do see it on plums, cherries, peaches. Who grows apricots? But if you were growing apricots, you grow apricots. Have you grown apricots? Well, I did. I got it for a couple of years, but then the branch died. Yeah. Well, if you had all those <laughs> tree relatives, this could have infect them. Okay. Yeah. So, but so that's what I'm, I'm giving this example because it's such an easy fix compared to say, spraying a whole tree with a fungicide, which is not an easy fix at all. It's expensive. And there's a limit to what you can even use, and it doesn't work that well. This works really, really well. So um, anytime you're pruning, there's just some sanitation steps to always take. Between every tree, you should be sterilizing your pruners. And if you're working on a tree that you know has some disease in it, you should sterilize your pruning tools between cuts. And I keep, I have two, uh, two pruners, and I just make take this little um, dish soap box and put um, eco bleach in here and water. And I have one pruner in there, and it's just sitting on the ground by the tree. One's in there while I'm working, and then I switch them, and I just switch them so it's kind of, it makes it easy anyway. Oh, or you can wipe with alcohol between everything. Whatever works for you that's easiest. But do clean your tools. Even if you don't suspect <coughs> disease, at least clean the tools before you move to the next tree. 
or the next bush because pruning moves disease organisms around. I mean, that's how we move pathogens around. Um, it's like using the same scalpel for five surgeries. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, let's just be clean here. That's exactly what it is like. And you can move diseases on your fingers. If you're hand pruning, if you're cutting, pulling water sprouts out of your apple trees by fingers, if you grab the water sprout and pull it back, it snaps clean, great. But if you're pinching it like this, and you get some you know, spores on your fingers, you'll just move it to the next. It's just the same as a, a pruning tool. It needs to be clean. So just, just be aware of that. It's simple things that really bite in the bum later if you've got an infected tree. Oh, here's my winter moth traps. So yeah, um, if it works for that species, it's great. That's a trap that's very easy to do. No winter moth in that tree. Um, yellow traps work really well to actually contradict. These are traps that control the problem as opposed to traps that just tell you if the problem was there. So the spotted wing drosophila trap and stuff I showed, pheromone traps, that just tells you you have the problem. These actually will kill enough of the insects to be used as a control. And this is a wireworm trap. It's a chunk of potato with a stick in it. And I, I always tie tags to them because I can never find the sticks. And you bury the potato just below the surface of the soil, like an inch deep or so. And um, you just wait for a couple days. And uh, if there's no other plants, so you can't get the weeds in there. Uh, because this is before you plant your crop. Uh, they're really attracted to the potato, and then you can pull the crops out. And then yeah. sometimes they're just completely wriggling with wireworms. So I gotta run them to. I'll be back uh, probably in about a half hour, and uh, so if I'm not here. <laughs> if you're not here, goodbye. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thank you very much. And, uh, oh, well, I'm glad you are here. just have an early lunch, I guess. Right, I'll be right back. Mm -hmm. What, I'm babysitting? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, now, this is the only spray I really like, and it's water. Uh, but again, it only works on a few things. But what it does work on, it works really well. If you have um, these funny little insects that look like slugs, if you see it on cherries and pears, there's pear slugs, and it's actually a, a kind of soft fly, which is related to bees. Uh, but the, the, the larvae do this. They skeletonize the lid. They remove a lot of leaf tissue. They're also extremely incompetent insects. If you just wash them off the tree, they're done. They can't get back. I don't know. They maybe have no instinct to climb up a tree. Anyway, you wash them off with water. You can put all kinds of chemicals in the water, and the effect would be exactly the same as if you just used pure water. So just use water. Um, she's spraying aphids off of a, a brock or a cauliflower plant or something. You can just blast water off with a lot of things. And if you have the water in the summer, and some of us don't have much water to use, you can keep powdery mildew down on squash plants and cucumbers and things by syringing the leaves off with water. So there are actually a few things that water sprays are as good as any chemical you can buy. I thought that the whole reason you got powdery mildew is because you're top watering. No, top watering prevents powdery mildew. Powdery mildews are an interesting group of fungi. They're what we call the fungi of dry weather. Remember, think back when you've seen powdery mildew. It's always the end of the summer, right? It's been yeah, when there's no rain. That's when there's no rain. The rain starts in September early, then you don't see more powdery mildew. But it goes till the end of October before it gets wet, we have the mildew right till there. So powdery mildews, and there's a whole bunch of different ones. Like the one that the, the, the species of fungus that goes on squash is not the same as the ones on beans. And that's different again than the ones on peas and different than roses or whatever. But they all show up at the same time of year because that group of fungi um, germinate in human conditions when the leaves are always humid. But if there's free water on the leaf, they can't germinate at all. So control before people had fungicides they would always just wash the leaves of cucumbers down with water because that controlled powdery mildew. Mm. Now, if you did that to an apple tree in the spring, you'd get apple scab like anything, right? But that's a different group of fungi. The, mildew, the powdery mildews are the fungi of dry weather. So I, I got it on my zucchini and I top water it and it was... Yeah, well, it's, it, you have to get both sides of the leaf. You have to do a really good side. job. When people, um, you know, in the Okanagan well, there's not nearly as many apple trees up there as used to be, the grapes and all kinds of other things. These are these big orchards with big overhead irrigation. Mm -hmm. 
and they didn't have powdery mildew problems till they stopped the overhead irrigation. Of course, they saved a lot of water. I mean, they had to stop using the water that way, but they had to then start to control powdery mildew, which they didn't have to do before, because it's it it suppresses it to be wet. The leaves are wet. <coughs> this is something you might need to apply on a field scale in if you're growing um, crops where there are um, flea beetles. Um, they, and they attack cabbage family, all cabbage family, but the beetles are really small. See how small they are? This, the hole is the same size as the beetle. That is the beetle. They are the size of fleas and they jump like fleas. And so when you see this damage, often you don't see the beetles because they've already off the leaves. He's coming. Huh? <laughs> He's coming. He's, yeah, exactly. Just, just vibrating the leaf a bit and the beetles will hop. So, um, but they like, they prefer the leafy, really leafy greens like mustard and arugula and stuff. They prefer that over broccoli and Brussels sprouts. Brussels sprouts. So you can actually economically use those leafy greens as a trap crop to pull them away if you're growing a market crop of these other big waxy leaved cabbage family things. Mm -hmm. It actually works quite well. I've, you know, if you run into problems with this, you can send me an email. I've, I actually have a flea beetle control program that I worked out for commercial growers on Salt Spring. So, it, you know, there's some timing issues and all that we won't go into today. But you can, it's like a push and pull. You kind of push, the, you push and pull the insects in the landscape so that they go here and the crop is there. And then, you know, sometimes in the fall, you can just put pyrethra and their soap sprays on this and get most of these adults before they go over winter because they're all on this crop, not on that crop. So let me know, you know, my website's up there. You can email me anytime. Isn't pyrethrin not good for bees? Yeah, you get this. You got to be careful. But uh, the bees wouldn't be going on a leafy mustard. There's no flowers. Well, there shouldn't be any flowers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, no, that's. I mean, really, I'm super aware of, of insects, uh, beneficial insects are uh, effects. Okay, so another thing in the toolbox that's big for home gardeners, but does have use for commercial growers are using barriers uh, to just prevent pests from laying eggs on the crop. Just plain out and out stop them. Here's a broccoli, uh, broccoli cauliflower thing growing here. And I've put a barrier around each plant, and commercial uh, organic growers do this too, because you, you do it at the time you transplant the seedling. So you do it all in one operation, and then you're done worrying about cabbage root maggot, which is really common. Everybody's got it, it's, region, it's through the whole region. The, the adult fly comes and lays her eggs. Um, she will only lay her eggs right where the cabbage stem goes into the soil. She won't lay her eggs over here. She won't lay her eggs on lettuce. She wants cabbage family and she wants it right at the soil line. So what I've done is you have a little barrier here and she never finds the kind of conditions that are, make her want to lay her eggs. And so you're done. You don't have to spray that or soak anything into the soil. And what is it that you use there? You can use anything that is waterproof enough to get through the season. I'll just show you some options. Yeah, you can use something like, I, you know, I cut apart compost bags and feed, chicken feed bags. They work great. Mm -hmm. Just cut them into squares. Growers used to use tar paper. No organic grower can use tar paper now. But this is the kind of principle. This is the size you need. You make a slit so that you can slide it along, sit it right on the soil, the stem of the plants through there. If it's really stiff material, you have to make a little space for the for the plant. I like I like this packing material off the of refrigerator. You can go to a, well, it used to be Sears stores, and we used to have Sears stores. You can go to the back of the store where they've unpacked your refrigerator, and you can get lots of this. But this this works great. Anything that's even. Um, Freezer paper, you know, the waxy oh, freezer the paper. Brown stuff. It, yeah, and the brown packing paper. If, they're, if it's waterproof enough, water resistant enough to get through a season, um, you can use little stones to kind of keep it flat. It'll work too. So you don't have to buy anything fancy. I've seen these now being sold in garden centers. They're quite expensive. Little cut little discs and all that. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> but that's all you need. And the principle here is, is that you get as tight to the stem as you can and with something that's going to last the season. And that's a barrier and you're done. The other kind of barrier Jeez. is, like this is carrots, you cover the whole crutch because you obviously can't do that to carrots. You know, so you cover the whole plant with something. Um,
for, for decades, growers have used floating row cover to cover carrots. Cheesecloth or something. It, yeah, well, cheesecloth doesn't let in enough light. And interestingly, and I'm glad you mentioned that because a friend of mine once, she said, oh, my carrots aren't growing, my carrots aren't growing. I'm like, what? What do you mean carrots? How can they not be growing? <laughs> They're over there and she'd use cheesecloth. But there wasn't enough light getting through. These materials have been designed to let in what's like 87% of the sunlight and the rain and irrigation can go through. But yes, so materials that look like they are letting in enough light, but they're not, they're not necessarily designed that way. Uh, like curtain material, this would not work, you know. But uh, now we have on the market these great products. Because I hate Rimei. It rips and it doesn't last and it's disposable. And I'm, I don't know. Um, we now have insect netting. Other parts of the world, growers have used insect netting for years, but we never needed it very much. We never had the nurseries and the farm suppliers weren't selling us these products, but now we can get, there's at least three brand names I know of, and there's a wholesaler in Montreal you can buy. If you're doing a large area, you can just buy it straight from them by That's the road. That's we're getting our stuff from today. Yeah, you're probably, it's probably, yeah. um, we're using re you're not, no, oh, no, you're probably using ProTech net. Yeah, our yeah. netting is not remade. We it's used probably, it last year. Yeah, he has it in the, in the market. Yeah, yeah but ProTech net, I bet. It's one of, this is a lightweight ProTech net, and this is a yeah. heavyweight ProTech wow. net. Yeah, and it's they're guaranteed for seven years, and they're really tough. You, yeah. They don't rip this and is snag. Right now. Yeah, so this is great stuff. So I'm glad you're familiar with that. So you could cover a strawberry bed for that darn fruit fly that's appeared. Uh, Current tree, current bushes. Like there's a cherry tree under it. Oh, it looks like um, tinworm. Uh, looks like a tent caterpillar, doesn't it? Does. Yeah. Well, as soon as I see that, I'm yeah. like, yeah, I know. It's well, you know what? Like this sounds expensive and like a hassle, but you have to cover cherries for birds anyway, right? Right. So this solves birds, and um, yellow jackets will rip fruit apart. So this solves everything, from fruit flies. To yellow jackets and bad. birds and raccoons don't seem to get this either. I've had raccoons tear my trees apart with bird netting. They climb the bird netting. But they don't climb these trees and they can't really get in here. They don't, I don't think they would smell the cherries the way that... Anyway, I have never had any trouble ripening cherries under this. Whereas the trees that I've only used bird netting on, they just destroy the raccoons. Just my cherry tree is huge. There's no way Well, you it. don't have to cover the whole tree. You can cover branches. And, and uh, this is what I mean about this technology. We're not so familiar with it, but if you go to Australian gardening sites, and you'll find they've been dealing with medfly and all kinds of really nasty fruit flies. They'll have all these neat things designed, these sleeves with Velcro that you just wrap around a tree branch and it Velcro's close like a big tube. And they'll just do it on big trees. They have mango bags, and they have ones that cover to fruits, trusses of of um, tomatoes because some of the fruit flies they have destroy tomatoes. We don't have, the, the ones we have, we're not worried about that. But they make all sizes and shapes of bags and tubes and <coughs> stringy pieces of fabric. And you know, this is a way to keep, you just prevent the pest from laying eggs on the crop. You'd have to do that after pollination though, right? <laughs> yes, although in some cases, most, most pollination on strawberries isn't done by insects anyway. But yes, you do it after pollination for the other things. Now, for cherries, the only time you have to cover is just when the fruit starts to ripen because those fruit flies are not attracted to the cherries until then. But birds so, eat green cherries, though. Well, you cover it before birds would get it, but it's long after pollination. Yeah, yeah. So you're good. You know, you can wait for that. You can thin fruit if you need to. Do whatever you want to, and then you've got time to do your barrier. And it works well. I, I do my blueberries. It was when I started covering my blueberries to keep off fruit flies that I discovered how many blueberries the birds had been eating that I didn't really realize. You know, a much bigger crop because nobody was eating it. And the birds don't even try it because they can't see the, through the mesh that the berries are there. You can bag individual fruit. Now this sounds really futile, but it's actually quite effective on a commercial scale. Organic growers in Washington State, apple growers, after your pollination, after your fruit thinning, and you're all done, and what's left on the tree is your apples, your, your crop, mm -hmm. you can put a bag on that. And these are disposable. These are made in Japan. These are Japanese fruit bags. You buy them by the thousand. They have a little twist tie. They pop that over the apple. We can't get them here yet. 
in smaller quantities. You can, you, you, from, there's a supplier up in the Okanagan for commercial orchards, and I think you can get them like thousands at a time. You can get these organza gift bags. You can buy these wholesale, and you just, that's Perfect. it. You just pop it over your apple, and you're done. That's so Genius. Pretty. Yeah, yeah. So don't go and buy them wholesale, I mean, retail at Michael's Craft Shop. Go online to Uline or something. You get them wholesale, and you get a lot of different sizes. And Genius. this is it. And it keeps off codling moth. Apple maggot, which is now here, unfortunately. And uh, people don't have scab problems either. So, so again, yes, it sounds tedious to do it, but you've just eliminated a whole bunch of pest problems. And the labor to apply the pesticide if you were spraying and all that other stuff. Does that work on the pears? Oh, yeah. Yeah, for calling Will it keep the pears yeah. away? Keep, oh, no, <laughs> bear. Did you say bears or pears? No, I said pears. You should bear. Yeah, no bears. Mm, no, they'll go through this way. How about a deer? Uh, no, I don't think a deer would bother with this. Um, now, a, con a concerted effort by a raccoon would get this kind of material. Uh, I do this, this is what I do for my grapes for raccoons. And I do, do use, uh, you, don't, um, you don't need uh, sunlight on the fruit. The sunlight's supposed to be on the leaf. So the fruit can be covered with really tough, strong, heavy material, like nylon and uh, you know, this is this is curtain material from the thrift shop. So now we're not worried about letting it get light. It's got to be breathable, though, right? It's got to be. Well, it should dry out quickly. Yeah. Um, this was this one doesn't have little holes. And then I've got the cord here is clothesline cord, and I bag the grape with it and tie it to the vine, and they have never gotten away with grapes. Sometimes they try it though; they squish at them, <laughs> <laughs> suck on the bag. Suck I wish I had a video at night, you know. <laughs> but very little injury because they can't get. They cannot physically get into these tough bags, and so then they don't come back. Raccoons don't last one long in my yard. Yeah, well. <laughs> I got chickens, so. Yeah. Anyway, um, so if they're tough enough, it'll keep raccoons out, but nothing will keep bears out. This is not a bear approach. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, here's the one that I really want to talk about. This is my favorite. Okay, we've got some time. There is already here. Uh, you don't have to buy them. There are already here a huge number of species that will do a lot of this work for you. And they probably already are doing it. You don't really realize that they, you know, how many are there. So protecting and attracting the native species is going to be the bulk of your insect control. There, there are only a few commercial species that are even reared compared to the thousands that are naturally here. And most of those, as I said earlier, are for greenhouse crops. They're not really useful outdoors. So this is just a few of the insects that attack aphids. This is that little orange maggot here. It's called the aphid midge. It has no really good common name. It's killing aphids. These, that's a lady beetle. Um, and there's lots of species of lady beetles. There are all kinds of colors. You may not recognize them. There's some that are gray and black. There's black ones with red spots. And there's lots of orange and red ones with black spots. And there's yellow ones with black spots. And there's plain ones with no spots. They're all different species. But these are immature lady beetles. So you might see these, this is eating uh, cabbage aphids, you might see these and not realize you're looking at a beneficial insect. Yeah. I've killed a few not knowing. I know, because yeah. they, they're always with the damaged leaf, right? Because they're eating the aphids. Yeah. Looks yeah. a little bit like Well, now you know beetle. you're not going to kill them. No this guy? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. they're smaller than yeah. mature aphids. Somebody should yeah. create an app where you take a picture of whatever pass and it identifies it for you. Yeah, they probably um, will. Yeah. Uh, there are pictures of all this on my website, though. At least it's not an app, but at least it's online. You can yeah. check it in the field if you need to. <clears throat> but anyway, this is why it's important to know what they look like, because you know this you might not even notice these little orange things, and they're they've totally got this handled. These the, the number of orange thing uh, larvae that are here is totally going to clean that aphid mess up. This is um, um, one of the many um, hoverflies that we'll see. You'll see them flying at flowers, and they hover like helicopters. Yeah. Well, the larvae <coughs> eat aphids, unbelievable amounts of aphids. They eat more aphids than any of these other insects. I've seen those things in my dirt. You probably saw another kind of fly in the dirt. I mean, the, oh, the, actual, the actual winged ones. Like oh. when I when I like turn the surface over, they'll be in the dirt and they'll be like, and then they'll fly off. Oh, they might be emerging from the soil because what happens is she lays her eggs by aphids. Yeah. The larvae eat till they're big enough. They fill and gorge themselves on aphids and they drop to the soil. 
and their little pupa case is there, and then the adult flies out of the soil. Mm. So it's, that is possible that you've seen that. Um, we have, there's so many parasitic wasps, and these ones attack aphids. This one is, a, there's an aphid there. She's laying her egg inside it. Uh -huh. So she's very tiny. She's the size of an aphid, right? This one, it fits inside a pea aphid. A pea aphid, this is a parasite of pea aphids. This one is a parasite of white flies. This is over in the lower mainland. This is an egg of a moth that lays its eggs on um, cranberries. This one is very common here, and it lays its eggs in all kinds of caterpillars, tent caterpillars and other things. Uh, that one, we, don't, we, we have a similar species here. It's black. And this, this is um, usually sticking out uh, behind. This is an ovipositor. She's drilling through bark to lay an egg in a bark beetle that's under the bark. <laughs> I mean, oh, it's amazing. This, there, there's all sizes. So there's ones that are just really, really tiny right up to huge. And they lay eggs inside insects. And the predator wasps, the <coughs> wasps, the, bolt, the hornets, and the yellow jackets eat an enormous amount of caterpillars. And they do take flies and things like that, but mainly it's caterpillars. They fly, they just take them right off the crop and fly them off to their nest. So don't kill them. So don't kill them. You they know, eat my mulberries, though. Well, they will to get moisture. Yeah. They'll start ripping uh, raspberries and things apart later in the summer to get water. Wow. And one of the things I'm going to recommend is that you provide water for insects. Just oh. like, a, like a bird bath or something. Like a bird bath with a rock or something in it huh. so they can't drown. Because if people have found, like, uh, yeah, I remember the, one of our growers on Salt Spring last year, the end of his cherry crop was totally lost because yellow jackets moved in on a hot, dry weekend, desperate for moisture. And they just rip the cherries apart. And but I do know that growers will. They'll, they'll take a 45-gallon drum of water out, put a fill with water, and put a, a plywood disc in the top. And the plywood just floats down on the water, and it's always oh, wet. Nice. And bees and yellow jackets and all kinds of things get water in this in our dry summers. Do we have to worry about chlorine? Chlorine? Not after, it, the gas goes off after. I time. think the bees okay. kind of prefer sludgy water. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you, you should but watch out for mosquito larvae growing. Yeah. You know, but it's the same kind of thing. Anyway, we have a lot of flies that parasitize things. You may not even think of flies doing that, but this is a tent caterpillar with eggs on its head. Oh, and my eyeballs. Uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Actually, his eyeballs are underneath there, and they're. They're black and looking the other way, but those are two eggs that have been laid on the caterpillar. And they'll lay the, the flies will come and lay the eggs pretty much only right here because the caterpillar can't get them off. If you, if you lay the eggs here, they can flick the eggs off. Wow. And that's one of the things that finishes off the tent caterpillars when we get a big population outbreak. Wow. That's, there's many things operating at that point. There's a lot of diseases of tent caterpillars, and then the wasps are laying eggs inside them, and you can't see that. But once you see the fly eggs being laid, you know that all this is, there's lots of natural enemies out there. Uh, this is, I've actually got this little, the one that's right in the middle. That was a cabbage, with that cabbage butterfly that you uh, have a bit of a hate on for, as we all do. Oh. <laughs> I kept the, the chrysalis, because I wanted to get a nice new specimen of a cabbage butterfly to show. Well, instead, this is what came out, that fly. Oh, so the caterpillar had the fly egg on it when it went to spin its chrysalis. And then the fly is it's quite smart, actually. The flies wait till the caterpillar has spun its cocoon or its chrysalis, whatever it's doing, and then it kills the caterpillar and uses its body for its own purposes. And so instead of, so the maggot that was the fly maggot ate the caterpillar, and the fly has just come out. Huh. Wow, that is so cool. I know. And uh, this is a fly that's laid a, some flies, the eggs hatch inside their body and they lay the maggot on the caterpillar instead of the egg. And the cat, now it's gonna burrow inside and kill that caterpillar. So yeah. it's, it's pretty gross actually, it's kind of like aliens. It's, it's totally, it's totally gross. Invasion of the body snatchers. It is totally, yeah. Uh, we have bugs, uh, true bugs, predator bugs, we have stink bugs, and here's this whole, look at the size of the caterpillar the stink bug is eating. That's a stink bug. That's a stink bug. I thought that was just... There's a lot of pest stink bugs, yeah. but there's some beneficial ones. The beneficial ones are really sharp points on their shoulders. Oh, okay. oh. Um, so, I thought that was a different species of tick or something. No, so. that's a stink bug that's a killer. 
And these are very tiny and very common. They're called pirate bugs, minute pirate bugs. Arr. And uh, yeah, they're, they're vicious. <laughs> uh, we used to raise them when I worked for the, the uh, biocontrol company. You watch them stabbing spider mites. They would stab spider mites and they would get so uh, hungry and voracious that they would just keep stabbing them and the, they would build up on their beak like they would just they wouldn't even clean their face off. off. Yeah, they would just they wouldn't even clean the, the goop off their face. Okay, so how do you get more of these into your farm crop? I mean, that's that's what we want to do, right? Well, almost everything that I showed you here, the adult needs pollen and nectar. It doesn't actually eat the pest. The lady beetles are an exception. Lady beetle, the adult lady beetle also eats aphids. But all of these other things I showed you, the um, the adult lays its eggs among aphids or white flies or on caterpillars or something. But it's the larvae that kill that are the meat eaters. And so what we need to do is provide food for the adult. So when like the female comes in to lay her eggs, she needs energy. She needs protein and carbohydrates, and she gets that from pollen and nectar. So you provide pollen and nectar. She comes where she has food, and the first place she starts to look for a place to lay her eggs is closest to where her food is. And that's used widely in agriculture now. That's a standard practice now to provide food for the beneficials in or around your crop. We learned that buckwheat attracts the parasitic wasp that lays eggs in aphids. Yes, it, and many plants do. Sweet alyssum is being used. Miles of it are grown in California in lettuce fields to attract aphid predators so that they will control the aphids in the lettuce. Uh, and actually, I've got a, anyway, uh, anything that has tiny flowers, and the book that I left with Guy has a, a whole table, and you can look that up. It, these insects need um, flowers that are small enough that they can drink the nectar without drowning. There's, they're very oh. tiny. You see them, now those little parasitic wasps fit inside an aphid, so they're very small. So they come to dill and goldenrod and cilantro and candy tuft and this is alyssum. And um, I'll, I'll show you this one. I'll go back to this picture in a minute. This are, these are commercial fields in Ontario. They're using uh, the sweet alyssum to attract the pirate bugs to eat pests in the, in the commercial strawberries, just like they're using in California the same crop. This is an annual, very easily grown. You know, or you can put permanent hedgerows around fields. This was a field I saw in England, but it was a hay field, but they had intentionally left the, uh, the whole verge here. With, and this was just alive with insects and, and bees um, when I was there. But this is a UBC planting. Mixed plantings that attract a variety of different insects, because they don't all eat exactly the same thing, pollen and nectar. Or you can go to this, you know, proven tent. I mean, sweet alyssum is the fastest fix for everything. Can you, can you uh, uh, screw yourself over by planting multiple things to attract multiple predatories where they're like competitive with each other? Not too much, no. What you want to be sure is that you're not interfering with your crop, uh, um, you know, too much. It's a balance between having too many of those plants and then interfering with how much space you have for your crop. So usually they're in uh, hedgerows or rows that fit in, you know, or farm field edges. We just ordered a whole bunch of that. Oh, sweet Alyssa? From, yeah. From Couldn't do better. Couldn't do better. Yeah. This is a home greenhouse. Quick <coughs> fix for aphids. You can buy aphid predators and put them in a greenhouse. Or you could put a sweet alyssum plant in the greenhouse. And then open all the doors and windows, take the vents off, take screens off, and in come the hoverflies. And they'll be in there 24 hours laying. There's eggs all over this leaf here. This is aphids, but there's an egg. There's an egg. There's an egg. This is the same leaf away <coughs> Oh, wow. They have like cleaned it, hmm. you know. So that's free. Yeah. We, so this we really, really plan. works. It's quite amazing how all that works. As I said earlier about the water supply, this is something you do in a garden, but on a larger scale, those 45-gallon drums, um, it's really important. Insects that prey on other insects don't have a water source when there's no dew in the morning. Their water source is dew, natural moisture, and streams and things. Whereas an insect that's a cat, think of a caterpillar eating a leaf, it's got water because it's eating a leaf, it's, it has moisture. So when it gets hot and dry, especially dry, and when it's dusty, these beneficial insects really get clobbered. 
because they, they're drying up and they don't have a water supply. So providing water, of just, I did research on this years ago with that little aphid midge that I showed you, the little orange uh, larva. If you provide water in the cage where the female is, um, she already has food, but if you just add water, it doubles her egg production. It's like, whoa, they live longer, but they lay a lot more eggs, because the first batch of eggs, they can lay based on their body reserves they already have. The next batch of eggs, they have to have food and water in the environment. And I had food in the cages for them. They licked the honeydew from the aphids. They didn't have water. And they had one that when we put water in, and it became a really important part of our rearing production commercially, because of course we want to get the maximum number of eggs, but of course you do too, in your farm field. So making sure beneficial insects have a water supply, it's kind of hard to see that it's working, except that it makes everything a lot more effective. And then we have all these ground beetles and, and insects. Now, they're not coming to plants for pollen and nectar, but they need um, areas where there isn't uh, uh, cultivation and tilling going on. They need sta uh, stable environments to live, places to go when fields are being cultivated. And they eat slugs and snails and root weevil larvae and root maggots. And um, that's the larva of one of these just so you know what they look mm -hmm. like. So be, be, you know, just remember that sometimes you're not used to looking at the larval stages like those uh, lady beetles. It looks eerily kind of like a thread almost. But they're oh, huge, they're, they're much bigger. Oh, I'll show you there. You wouldn't mistake it. Yeah, they're, they're shaped like a thrips, but here's, here's the ground beetles. They're big, they're big, big babies. And you tend to see them at night, you know, running around. So they're... So these guys are beneficial? Oh yeah. They're your best friends. I've always liked that. Yes, yeah. People in cities tend to freak out because they think they're, they're uh, cockroaches. <laughs> <laughs> Not cockroaches, but I want to show you, here's another little beetle that doesn't look at all like a beetle, and you may see these when you're gardening or, or turning the soil. And they're also oh, yeah. the same kind of beneficial. They're called rove beetles. They're okay. sort of about the size and length of an airway, but they have no pinchers. Right. So, good guys. So beetle banks, that's just, you know, providing an area in the field that is not cultivated. And, but it's not necessarily trees and shrubs either, it's just grassy areas, it's refuge for those. So these are ways that people have, be, have begun to figure out how to enrich the environment so it takes all the pest management job off of your shoulders. You just let them get on with it. I've these thinking that it's well, I'm glad you learned something today. <laughs> I mean, even the Brits are getting with the no dig. You know, lo the more you can minimize cultivating whenever you're figuring out your crops, the, you know, keeping the minimum amount of cultivating down, you know, do the least harm to all these creatures. <coughs> so now the question is, is, is there something you should buy? Well, basically, not much, unless you're doing greenhouse work. Mm. Um, they're, they're expensive, they're perishable, and they're really picky. If you buy a parasite, for green peach aphid, the little parasitic wasp, it, it won't go on, on something else. Like, it's not going to like aphids on potatoes. It won't go there. They're really picky. So if you get the predator mite for spider mites, it won't eat other kinds of spider mites. So you need to really know what you're doing. So this one is, this is a close-up of the one I've been showing you, that aphid midge. It works really well but there's also a lot of them already out there in the wild. Mm -hmm. So if you attract them and don't spray, right. which would kill them, you probably don't have to buy them. But if you had a temporary situation, like your fruit trees, um, or in a greenhouse crop, you, if you buy them, they work. They're, they're, they're effective. Why do you avoid the mantis? Well, they eat anything. Oh, okay. They eat butterflies. They eat lace wings, which are beneficial. They eat each other. <laughs> they eat each other. Uh, when they're little, they eat little stuff. And when they're middle sized, they eat middle sized stuff. And when they're big, they eat big stuff. And they have no pest impact. They just eat other insects. Uh, so they're not really a. They're, they're cool, though, in a little biology class in schools. but.